All right, good evening. I've got 6.30 on my clock here, Central Time, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Rick Smith. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist here at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Norman. We appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, we got people from all over the place on here. And in just a few minutes, I'm gonna ask you to tell me uh, where you're from and how many people are watching. You don't have to do that now, but we'll do that in just a second. Um, if you have not participated in one of these before, uh, the only thing you're going to need is your computer speakers or the speakers on your iPad or your tablet or if you're using the app, maybe even on a phone. You do not need a microphone. Our sole interaction is going to be through the question box and lots of people have already found it and have been typing and you can type all you want in there, type questions or type things you're unclear about. Um, Sometimes when we do these, we have two or three people who are assisting tonight, it's just me. So there's, I'll apologize in advance, there's no way we're gonna be able to get to every question and every comment, but I did wanna let you know that you can type your questions in there. Um, your questions, even if we don't answer them, they do help us because we go back and review those questions after the webinar, and sometimes we're able to reply to you directly or uh, they, they help us improve the future webinars. The questions that you ask sometimes make us realize we need to include more topics in the webinars. So we appreciate everybody being here. Uh, the training that we're gonna do this evening was developed specifically for storm spotters in the National Weather Service Norman County Warning Area. There are 122 local National Weather Service offices around the country. And I see people on here already from Montana and Pennsylvania and Missouri and Texas and including our own area here, Ohio, um, Georgia, Ohio, another Ohio. Um, the, spot, the storms behave basically the same no matter where you are. So this training is gonna be a benefit to you no matter where you are. But some of what I'm gonna talk about is specific to our office and the challenges our spotters face. Every National Weather Service office around the country does storm spotter training. And with the pandemic going on, we've all had to go to nothing but these virtual sessions like this. So if you're in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Minnesota or Montana, check your local National Weather Service office um, and, and, and participate in their training as well. This is gonna be a little bit Oklahoma and Texas centric. We're not gonna talk about hurricanes. We're not gonna talk about lake effect snow. We're gonna talk about tornadoes, supercell thunderstorms that we see here in the plains. But I think there'll be good information uh, for everybody here. Uh, there will be a couple of frequently asked questions. Is this being recorded? Unfortunately, we're not recording this one. Uh, the, the number one question we always get is, will, will you get a certificate? You will get a certificate. If you complete the webinar and we can tell by the statistics that we get back, if you if participated and completed the whole thing, we'll email a certificate of participation to the email address that you use to register for the webinar. So if your email address was misspelled or something or the email that we send you goes into your spam folder. You may not see that certificate immediately, but we will send that out. Now it may not be, it's not going to be tonight. It may not be tomorrow. It may be later in the week uh, by the time we get that done. Um, I mentioned a while ago, but for those of you who just joined, if you're not aware, uh, we're, we're kind of ground zero for a big major ice storm that happened. We're 54 days before winters even began. And we've had an early season ice storm that's pretty historic right now in Oklahoma. We have close to 400,000 utility customers without power, including at my house. I had to come into the office to do this, but um, uh, that we're dealing with that. So we appreciate there being as many people as there are here with us this evening. Um, and somebody's already asked, is will this count for your local area? Will this allow me to be a trained spotter or a certified spotter in whatever state that you're in and i can't tell you the answer to that we'll provide you with the certificate and it's all it's up to the local national weather service office or your local emergency manager or your storm spotter group to decide whether or not they accept this as valid training that's that we have nothing to do with that uh, so we appreciate you joining us and we hope we hope that it is it is helpful I'm just gonna tell you right now, the way this system works is at some point tonight, you're gonna hear nothing. You're gonna lose audio. It should only last a minute or less. So just kind of hang in there. If you see everything freeze up for you know a few minutes with no sound, then you may have an issue on your end, but um, it's almost 100% guaranteed that somebody is not going to be here, not gonna be able to hear part of this. 
So just, just know that that is normal and just hang in there for a minute or less and the, the sound should come uh, right back. All right, let's see the next slide here. Okay, this is where the audience participation comes in. We need to know how many people are viewing this training. So I need you to type in the question box right now, how many people, including you, are attending the training? So for example, if it's just you, but all by yourself, you put one person. If it's you and your spouse, brother, child, friend, buddy, enemy, whatever. If it's just you two, you put two. If it's you and 18 of your closest friends, you put 19. So just put the number of people that are attending this. This helps us get a truer representation of how many people are actually participating. Because we have 193 people logged into the webinar, but in, in a lot of cases, there's more than one person watching this. I'm seeing lots of twos, there's a three, a two, twos, lots of twos. Sometimes we have 20 or 30 people viewing it, probably not in with the pandemic going on, but usually we'll have large groups uh, viewing this. So we appreciate that. You can put that in at any time and I'm gonna bug you for it again. So if you didn't put it in now, I'm gonna bug you for it again in a little while. All right, storm spotters are an integral part of something we call the integrated warning team. The integrated warning team is made up of three basic groups. It's made up of the National Weather Service. It's made up of our broadcast partners in the television and radio stations. The media is a huge part of the integrated warning team. And of course, EM stands for Emergency Management, Public Safety Agencies. Th those partners are valuable uh, uh, partners with us in the integrated warning team. And storm spotters are really kind of the glue that holds all of this together because storm spotters provide information that benefits the National Weather Service most definitely. The information you provide most definitely benefits the emergency management community in knowing what's going on in your area and, in, and it helps the media. The media sometimes have their own spotters or trackers or chasers, but storm spotters, any reports that you send in to the National Weather Service we turn around and share with the world so that all the emergency managers get it, all the TV stations get it. So you're a critical part of that. Now we talked about, we're just gonna, we're talking a lot about our county warning area. Uh, you are, no matter what state you're in, you're served by one of 122 local National Weather Service offices around the country. The office that I work in is responsible for 56 counties. We're responsible for 48 counties in central and western Oklahoma, along with eight counties in western North Texas. That's called our county warning area, and that's the area that my office is responsible for. And we're responsible for every forecast, warning, uh, the ice storm warnings, the winter storm watches, the flood advisories, the tornado warnings, the heat advisories, all of that stuff, any piece of weather information, along with the routine forecast comes from your local uh, National Weather Service office. So if you don't know who your local National Weather Service office is, or you don't have a relationship with them, by all means, I'd encourage you to do that. I mentioned up front that every office does these trainings. So if you're in another state, you should really participate in the training that your local office puts on as well, because they're gonna have very specific information to your local area uh, that we may not cover here. Uh, this evening. Here's a little video of our office and videos uh, kind of are sketchy on this GoToWebinar format sometimes. So it's going to be a little jerky, but this kind of just gives you an overview of what our office in Norman looks like on a busy, busy, severe weather day. This is a day where we would have just about every chair full. And this was not the 2020 season. Uh, this is the 2019 season. 2020 season, we had about half that number of people in the room because of the, the virus. So uh, we're still able to maintain all of our severe weather operations, but we're using telephones, we're using televisions, we're using radio, we're using radar as one of our primary tools to get weather information out. But radar can't tell us everything. Radar is a great tool, but it cannot tell us everything that's going on. So when one of our forecasters is looking at radar screens, this is a, a sample of what one, one forecaster's radar screen might look like during severe weather. So we're looking at all kinds of radar data, and it's not just the base level radar data that you may see on a, on a website or on your, or your phone app, but we're looking at all levels of the storm. And we're very, you know, our forecasters are very good at interrogating the storms to see what's going on. 
So we can tell with almost 100% certainty that there's a storm going on just looking at radar. I mean, we can identify it, we can see the reflectivity, and we know that there's a storm out there. Beyond that, we're not, we don't know anything. We think if we're dealing with a severe storm, we think that it's producing or maybe about to produce severe weather by the radar characteristics and by other data that we're looking at. But what we need you for, what spotters are there for, is to tell us what's really happening. Radar cannot tell us what's really happening. Only a spotter can do that. I'm not gonna talk a lot about winter weather, but since we're in the middle of an ice storm here, spotters are very beneficial during winter weather too. The only reason we know whether it's sleeting or freezing rain for sure is if somebody on the ground tells us. Radar can give us indications and we can get data that kind of helps us think we know if it's sleeting or freezing rain or snow, but only trained storm spotters, only human beings can tell us that for sure. So this applies to winter weather as well as severe weather. So when we were, when we were, one of the main tools that we use for severe weather detection and warnings is Doppler radar. These radar sites are scattered all around the United States. We have three in our area that we're responsible for. And when these radars are operating, there's an antenna inside there and it's shooting out pulses of energy. And these pulses of energy uh, go out, let me go back to this, uh, go, go out in a straight line. So you can see the radar uh, tower there on the left-hand side, and you can see that little uh, yellow beam that goes out from that. The green uh, surface, that's the surface of the Earth down there. So the further away that that radar beam gets, uh, gets away from the radar tower, the higher up it is in the storm because the Earth's surface curves while this radar beam is pretty much going in a straight line. It's like shining a flashlight into a dark room. Um, it's going in a straight line. So the further away we are from the radar, the higher up we're seeing in the storm. So if we're very close to the radar. If you see this, the storm that's very close here to the radar and there's this lowered cloud base right here, the radar may give us some pretty good data on what's going on in the lower parts of the thunderstorm. But this storm that's way out here far away from the radar that's actually producing a tornado, we can't see the tornado. We can't see anything that's going on at ground level because that radar beam is so high off the ground. So storm spotters are so critically important to help us know what's, what's really happening. So radar is a great tool for telling us what's going on in the atmosphere and what's going on in the middle and upper parts of the thunderstorm. But where the most important weather is happening, where the most important stuff is happening is down at the bottom of that storm. And that's where storm spotters really come into play. So storm spotters make reports. If you're a storm spotter, you're gonna report what you're seeing, what you're experiencing to your local officials, to the local National Weather Service office or whoever you're reporting to. What makes a good report? What is a good uh, spotter report? Well, a good spotter report is timely, uh, especially if we're talking about severe weather, tornadoes, flooding, hailstorms, windstorms, things like that. Uh, warnings are issued on in the matter of seconds or minutes. So the faster you can get the information to us, the better. An another characteristic of a good spotter report is that it's concise. Uh, it's, it's very easy to get very wordy and say we're talking on the phone and you're giving us a report or even on Twitter or social media or however you're giving us a report, get down to the, the nitty gritty. Don't, you know, don't, don't ramble on and give us all the details. Just tell us exactly what you're seeing, where you're seeing it, what it's doing and things like that. Be very, very concise with your report. It's important to be calm and it, it may be hard to be calm if you're experiencing you know, something you've never seen before like a tornado or giant hail or something like that, but uh, be very calm, be clear in your description. We're gonna talk about how to describe things and what we need to hear reports of in just a little bit. Obviously, accuracy is very, very important. We want the reports to be good reports. We want it to be accurate. Now, sometimes, no fault of a spotter, you may think you see something that you, that's not really what you think it is, and that's okay. I mean, we're not gonna, you're not getting graded on this or anything, but accuracy is certainly very, very important. One of the most important things for a spotter is to be objective. Um, if you go out looking for a tornado, if you go out expecting you're going to see a tornado, then any little cloud in the sky that looks remotely like a tornado is going to be a tornado to you. So you have to be very objective and report only what you see. Be descriptive. If you're not sure what it is, it's perfectly okay to tell us that you're not sure 
what it is. Being objective is very, very important. But the most important thing, the most important role of a spotter is your safety. We don't want you doing anything dangerous or stupid to get the information for us to, or to get us a report. Safety is the number one goal of a storm spotter. So spotters are, are safely observe, identify storms in your area and report what you're seeing. So safety is always number one. You have to use all your, all your senses and all the data that you have available to be safe. Uh, some spotters that we have in our area are mobile spotters like these that are actually out in a vehicle positioning themselves in a spot to see the action area of the storm or to see the part of a storm where a tornado might be developing. For example, some of you may be what we call point spotters. Some of you may be spotters that are just looking out your back door or on the back porch spotting, and those are both very, very valuable. Uh, we're going to talk some about mobile spotters, some about point spotters, but uh, no matter what you're doing as a spotter, safety is the number one goal. Now, radar data is an important part of storm spotting. When you're a storm spotter, your job is not to stare at the radar screen and report what you're seeing to us on the radar screen. We've got more radar data than you could ever imagine. So we don't need spotters telling us what the radar is showing. We need spotters telling us what's going on outside the window. But radar can help you be safe and informed when it comes to uh, severe weather. Radar can help you identify more for more certainly what kind of storm you're looking at. Sometimes we're going to talk a lot about supercells here in just a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to tell just by looking visually at the clouds if this is really a supercell. But sometimes comparing what you see in the sky to what radar is showing you can, can help you uh, be more confident in what you're looking at. Uh, we're going to talk about danger areas around supercells. There are certain parts of the storm that are more likely to produce damaging hail. There are certain parts of the storm where tornadoes are most likely to occur. And knowing where you are, looking at radar, knowing where you are in relation to that radar signature can help you be safer around severe storms. It can also help you with questions like, what am I looking at? Sometimes there's very confusing things in the sky in a thunderstorm. And you may be wondering, is that a shelf cloud? Is that a wall cloud? Is that a funnel cloud? And sometimes just a quick glance at radar uh, can help you with that. It can help you with storm motion. I don't care how long you've been spotting or looking at storms, it's very difficult standing out on the side of the road to look at a storm in front of you and say that storm is moving from 210 degrees at 32 miles an hour. I don't know anybody that can do that. So even knowing which direction the storm is moving, radar is critical for that. And one of the most important things, especially for mobile spotters, is getting out of the way of the storm and not being in front of the storm or not being run over by the hail part of the storm, for example. So using radar data to know what the storm motion is and other storms in the area. There's almost never just one storm that we're looking at. Usually there's multiple storms going on. So radar can help you know, um, okay, I'm looking at the storm to my north, but why is the sky dark down to my south? Oh, there's another giant storm down there that I need to be aware of. So radar is a wonderful tool. Now we don't want you driving down the road with radar in on your phone or on a, on a, a laptop or something while you're driving. We want, don't want you to be, we want you to be safe, but if you have access to radar or if you're a storm spotter who's working with an organized group and maybe the net control station has access to radar data and they can uh, give, you, give you updates on what's going on in the radar. However you use radar data, it's very important to use it. But remember, we're not asking you to spot what's on radar. We don't care, we know what's on radar. We need you to tell us what's going on outside your window. Now, radar is a valuable tool in any kind of weather, but it's critical to know during severe weather that radar is a snapshot. It is a snapshot of something that happens in time. So depending on your connection, you're going to see a Volkswagen driving across the screen here. What you're seeing in radar is radar is a picture of that Volkswagen as it passes. That's, that's like what radar sees with the storm. By the time you get that radar image on your phone or on the computer or at a TV station, it's old. You're, there is no such thing as completely live radar data because the radar has to take a picture of the storm in a sense, get that data back and process it. So it's never live data. So you have to remember that, that just because you're looking at something on radar, 
you have to remember that that's not exactly where it is. That's where it was a minute ago or two minutes ago or five minutes ago. So know that radar is never live, it's just a snapshot. And there are, there are radar limitations that apply to every single radar out there. It doesn't matter what app you're using, what TV station you're watching, what uh, National Weather Service radar site you're looking at. Every radar, because of the laws of physics, have um, some limitations. Radar is not going to pinpoint every time the exact location. Now, sometimes, you know, we'll talk about street level mapping and they can pinpoint it down to the nearest intersection. Most of the time, we're not able to do that because radar, again, the, the, if you're, unless you're very close to the radar, you can't see that level of detail and the accuracy gets, gets less as you get further out. So the radar is not going to always pinpoint the exact location of a tornado, for example. Radar is never going to be able to detect every single tornado and hailstone and wind gust that happens. That's why we need spotters. So radar cannot do all of that by itself. There are algorithms or computer programs built into the radars. Sometimes they're not very accurate. They're, if you use radar data at all, whether it's on radar scope or GR analyst or whatever you may be looking at, you know, there's algorithms that say this storm likely has 1.5 inch hail. That doesn't mean the storm has 1.5 inch hail. It means the radar computer thinks it does, but it's up to you to tell us, well, actually it's only a one inch or actually now it's two inches. So those algorithms aren't always accurate. So we can't rely on those to tell us what's happening. We need you. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for half a second and just scan the questions here. And I'm going to jump into some more of the safety stuff here. If you got questions or anything as we go along, please type those in the question box at any time. Only you and I can see that. And I'll try to answer some as I go along. I won't be able to get them all. The most dangerous thing for storm spotters around thunderstorms is lightning. By far, this is the most dangerous thing. It's more dangerous than a tornado or hail or anything else. The reason for that is every single thunderstorm produces lightning. We had lightning and thunderstorms here this morning with freezing rain. We had lightning and thunderstorms yesterday morning with sleet and freezing rain happening. Anytime it's lightning, you're at risk of being struck by the lightning. So the basic rule of thumb to be safe from lightning is don't be outside in the lightning. When thunder roars, go, go indoors. Or if you see a flash, dash inside. That's, that's the lightning safety. That applies to all of us and it applies to storm spotters as well. Um, when we're talking about mobile spotters, especially, <clears throat> often the best spotting locations for spot for people to see a storm are often the most dangerous for lightning. I mean, we want to be up on a elevated location, maybe, so we can have a good view of the horizon, or we can see over the trees or whatever, and that puts us at danger for lightning. So you're you're at you're at risk of, of being struck by lightning if you're out being a storm spotter. If you're a mobile spotter or you're around a thunderstorm, um, you need to stay in your vehicle. Your vehicle is generally a good lightning shelter. It's not a good tornado shelter. It's not really a good hail shelter in a lot of cases, but if it's an enclosed vehicle, it's a pretty good spot to be in a lightning storm. But even when you're in a vehicle as a spotter, when lightning's happening, you wanna avoid contact with the steering wheel, the radios, putting your arm on the, the window ledge, things like that, your vehicle can still get struck by lightning. There's nothing magical about the car, or the truck, that means it's immune from being struck by lightning. Uh, the body of the vehicle just makes it, it makes a shell or a cage over you to protect you in most cases from lightning. But if you're touching that cage, if your arm's on the window or you're holding onto the steering wheel or you're holding onto a radio microphone that's connected to an antenna, on the roof of the vehicle, then you may have problems if lightning strikes. Um, dozens of people are killed and, and many hundreds are injured by lightning every year. Most of those people are doing the exact things we tell them not to do. They're outside under a tree, they're working on a roof, they're uh, in a, under a, a picnic pavilion or a porch or something like that. Your only safe places in lightning are inside an enclosed building or inside an enclosed vehicle. Large hail can be a, a threat. Now in parts of the country, we got people on here from all over the, the country in, 
we got people from Pennsylvania, for example, in parts of Pennsylvania, large hail might be the size of a dime or a nickel because you just don't see hail that often. In Oklahoma and Texas, a dime and a nickel size hail happens pretty often. We had that happening this morning when it was 32 degrees outside with thunderstorms. So large hail uh, it depends on your perspective, but the National Weather Service definition of large hail is hail that is three quarter, or I'm sorry, one inch in diameter, one inch in diameter or larger. That's what we define as large hail. Um, and that is what we classify as a severe thunderstorm. If a thunderstorm has one inch diameter hail, then we classify it as uh, severe. Now you can get large, you can get hail from any kind of thunderstorm, but the largest hail typically happens with supercell storms. That, that hail usually falls in a specific area of that storm. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. So we certainly worry about the large hail like this. These, this is tennis ball a size hail that can cause a lot of damage to you, your car, your home, anything that's outside. But sometimes we get a lot of small hail. This is a, a, a fairly common occurrence where we get a, a large amount of very small hail. So even though this is not baseball size hail, this is you're driving on ice. This is this picture was taken down in Texas on May 31st, 2019. This is not a wintertime picture. This is a, a late spring, early summer kind of picture. So it was probably in the 80s, right before this storm happened, and now there's ice covering the ground. So just know that just because the hail isn't giant doesn't mean that it can't cause problems. That's just like driving on the icy roads that we have outside here over the past uh, couple of days with the ice storm that's going on. The deadliest hazard from thunderstorms and the deadliest weather hazard in almost every year is flooding. More people die from flooding than from any other weather-related hazard. Um, and most people that die in flooding die in a vehicle or uh, either they've driven their vehicle into a flooded area uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, many times people are driving around barricades to get where they need to go very, very quickly. And a, a large majority of the flash flood deaths this year include happen when people drive into flooded areas or walk into flooded areas. So our saying, our, our slogan for flood safety is really, you know, turn around, don't drown. If you don't know for sure how deep the water is, uh, don't drive through it. Um, that's, as, that's as simple as it gets. And, and you may think you know how deep it is, but um, um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to tell sometimes, especially at night. Now, tornadoes get the most publicity around here. They're the, the most exciting weather thing, but they're not as common as, as you might think. Even here in Oklahoma, we average uh, 56, 57 tornadoes a year. This year has been very much below average, which is a good thing. But uh, the number one danger from tornadoes is not the tornado itself, but it's what's in the tornado. It's the flying and falling debris that's in and around the tornado. The rules for tornado safety, the guidelines for tornado safety are pretty much the same around the country. It doesn't matter where you are. You want to get out of the way of that flying and falling debris. So you wanna get as close to the ground as possible. If you have an underground shelter, a storm cellar, a basement, um, around here, some people call them Freddy holes or call different things, uh, but you have a storm shelter, an engineered storm shelter to go to, obviously that's the best place. Underground is usually the best place, but most of us don't have that. So you wanna get in the middle of a sturdy building, as low to the ground as possible, put as many walls and barriers between you and the storm as you possibly can, get in as small a space as you possibly can, and avoid doors and uh, windows as much as you possibly can. Um, you, you want, that may be a bathroom, it may be a closet, a hallway under the stairs. Your goal is to put as many barriers between you and that uh, tornado as you possibly can. So that, that's the basic rules. Vehicles are horrible, horrible places to be in any kind of tornado. It doesn't have to be a big, huge tornado to completely destroy vehicles. Um, these are a couple of pictures from storm damage surveys I went on last year. This is a truck that we found about a half mile or more, maybe a little bit more than a half mile from where it began. Uh, I never did really find out what, what make or model this truck was, but we found it out in a field. We had to take uh, four wheelers out in the field to even get to it. But this is the, what a tornado 
uh, can do to a, this was a, a large pickup truck, you know, a big heavy duty uh, pickup truck. So tornadoes, okay, it's a Ford truck there. I see it on the bottom of the screen there. And it was carried a half a mile back on May 23rd of last year and a big, uh, a big tornado. Missiles can, can easily penetrate the uh, vehicle's body, the windshield, the vehicle, the sides of the vehicle. Took this picture on a damage survey in El Reno, Oklahoma. This was a, a very fast developing, fast moving tornado that, that, that was throwing flying debris through the air. And this, this missile, this board became a missile and just penetrated the vehicle uh, right there. And vehicles can be hit by other things, by other vehicles. This is that same damage survey. This is a motel parking lot. The motel was destroyed. I don't know if you can notice up in the top right-hand corner, you see a dark green object. That's a dumpster. And that dumpster actually was flying through the air and hit that red uh, pickup truck um, and before it landed up on the second floor of, of that hotel. So uh, tornadoes and vehicles just do not mix. And I'm gonna pause here uh, just for a second. We got a question, what happens if you're in a car and a tornado warning is issued? My answer is don't be in your car if a tornado warning is issued, if you can help it. Pay attention to the weather. If it's a severe weather day, if there's tornado watches or severe thunderstorm watches in effect, try to delay your trip. Pay attention to what's going on between you and your destination because you don't wanna be on the road at all. If you're on the road and hear a tornado warning or, in, or see some signs that there could be a dangerous storm nearby, you wanna get off the road as quick as you can. You wanna go find a sturdy building, a restaurant, a truck stop, uh, a convenience store, uh, any, anywhere that's, that's it's a sturdy building that you can get inside to protect yourself from the tornado or from the hail or, or whatever. Um, so you need to you need to do that if you're caught on the road in a tornado really you've made a series of bad decisions already and there are no ultimate good decisions at that point some people have survived staying in their vehicle some people have survived getting in a ditch or under an overpass people have also been killed in ditches and under overpasses so your best option is to do everything in your power to pay attention to the weather use the information that you have and um um, you know, try to avoid getting into that situation. Okay, while we're on tornadoes here, I'm going to talk about another, another few questions here. Can tornadoes happen without warning? Absolutely. The vast majority of tornadoes in our area have a warning in effect, especially the big damaging tornadoes. 95% plus of those will have a warning in effect before they happen, but they can develop quickly. And that happens every year where we have tornadoes develop before uh, there is a warning. Somebody asks, what do I do if I hear a tornado siren? Well, tornado sirens are controlled by your local community. That's not a National Weather Service thing. They're either controlled by your local emergency management, by the fire department, the police department, some city or county government usually controls those. And they are sounded in communities for very different reasons. So the first thing you need to do, if you've just moved to a new area, you need to contact somehow your local emergency management, see if they have a Facebook page or a Twitter account, or if they're on, online somewhere, where you can find information about when they sound their sirens, because some communities will sound their sirens for very different reasons. Um, some will be just only if their spotters see a tornado coming right toward the town. Some will do it any time a warning is issued for anywhere in their county and everything in between. So the, the most important thing to know now, a siren should never be your primary warning source and sirens should never be your only warning source. You need to be paying attention to all kinds of other information before sirens because the most important thing about sirens is sirens are only intended for people that are outdoors. They are called outdoor warning sirens. So if you, you're not supposed to be able to hear them in your house or your apartment or your hotel or your business, they are for people only that are outside. So don't depend on uh, sirens. What causes more deaths, tornadoes or floods? Tornadoes get the most attention, but floods by far on average every year kill many, many more people than tornadoes. Now we've had exceptions. In 2011, we had hundreds of people killed by devastating tornadoes, but usually the number is not that high. Usually by far flooding kills many more people um, than tornadoes. Are tornadoes caught on radar or reported from spotters typically? Both. Uh, we, we can't see the tornado itself on radar. We can see 
signs that the storm may want to produce a tornado, but we can't see the tornado itself on radar. Uh, spotters really tell us that that, that that tornado is there. Uh, if you're in a car when there's a tornado, would the safest place be a ditch? Again, we touched on that. I can't really tell you. Uh, it depends on your situation. I, there's um, There's been people that have taken cover in ditches and have been just fine. There's been people um, been that have been killed in ditches. May 31st, 2013, we had a, a 2.6 mile wide tornado with nearly 300 mile an hour winds on the west side of Oklahoma City. Eight people died in the tornado. They died, all eight of those died in vehicles. 13 people died from flooding. And 12 of those people died because they were taking shelter from the tornado in drainage ditches. They drowned taking shelter from the tornado or drainage ditches. So that do everything in your power not to be outside or not be in your vehicle when there's any chance of a uh, tornado. Uh, just a couple more here. Um, will tornado, what will tornado season 2021? Nobody knows. Nobody can tell you. I couldn't tell you what, if we're talking about this in March of 2021, nobody knows. Uh, it's Tornadoes are, are formed by thunderstorms and one thunderstorm can produce 20 tornadoes all by itself. So it's impossible. Nobody can tell you if it's gonna be above or uh, below uh, average. And let's see, one more here. Does the debris ball on radar tell the strength of a tornado? The debris ball is kind of a signature on radar. We'll talk about it more in just a little bit. That, but uh, you can't really tell the strength of a tornado. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I got some slides coming up about that. So we'll move on. Keep your keep your questions coming, and we'll try to uh, address them as we go along. Okay. Now this is for Oklahoma and North Texas. This is one of those very area specific things. This does not apply to Alabama or Montana or Pennsylvania or Ohio. This this applies to you know parts of Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, Texas that this area, uh, this is the, the climatology of tornadoes. The majority of tornadoes in this area happen in the March through June uh, timeframe. So 82% of our tornadoes happen in March through June and over 40% of those happen uh, during the month of May. Uh, we can get tornadoes at any time of year uh, in, in this area and pretty much anywhere, tornado season, People always ask, when is tornado season? Tornado season begins on January 1st and ends on December 31st. That's tornado season. Tornadoes will happen anytime you get the right ingredients coming together. It's very likely we're having tornadoes now or will have tornadoes along the Gulf Coast as uh, Hurricane Zeta makes landfall down in New Orleans right now. And on the right side of that, on the along the coast, there's tornado watches and probably warnings in effect right now. Anytime you get the right ingredients together, you can get a tornado. Again, this is very specific to our area. Most of the tornadoes happen in our area, Oklahoma and Texas. Two thirds of them happen between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. Tornadoes can happen at any hour of the day and night. They're least common at, you know, just after sunrise in the morning. They're most common four or five, six o'clock in the evening. Um, and that's just how thunderstorms work. But again, if you get the right ingredients coming together at three o'clock in the morning, you can have a bad tornado, but they might happen most often in our area uh, during the late afternoon, early evening. If you're in the Mid-South area over around, you know, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, in that area, that's where I grew up. Tornadoes happen, you get a lot of your killer tornadoes that happen after midnight, that happen at dark. So your, your local tornado climatology is gonna vary. Most tornadoes move from the Southwest to the Northeast or from the West to the East, but they will move any way the storm carries them. The tornado forms from a thunderstorm and it's basically gonna move where the thunderstorm goes. So if the thunderstorm is going from the northwest to the southeast, the tornado is going to go from the northwest to the southeast. So that's another time radar can help you. The average forward speed of a tornado, not the wind speeds in the tornado, but the, the moving along the ground is 30 miles an hour. But tornadoes can stand perfectly still and they can also move over 60 miles an hour. Most tornadoes only last 10 minutes or less and most last five minutes or less. It's very rare and very unusual to get a tornado that's on the ground for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or more. It does happen, but usually they are on the ground less than uh, 10 minutes. We rate tornadoes according to how much damage they produce. And you may have heard of the EF scale or the enhanced Fujita scale. 
This is a scale that engineers have developed to help us estimate. Now, this is always an estimate. Estimate the wind speeds that might have caused the damage. The scale goes from zero uh, to five. EF zero maybe has wind starting about 65 miles an hour, going up to about 85 miles an hour. And you can see the different colors there. An EF five tornado likely has winds over 200 miles an hour. Now we're not measuring these winds in almost any case. We're just going out and looking at the damage. So all we can do is go out and look at the damage that the tornado left behind. And we use this scale to say, okay, well, if the wall, if all the roof has gone, you know, if all the roof has gone off the house and some of the walls are gone, then that meant that was probably a tornado in the EF3 range. It took that that amount of wind to cause that damage. So we can never tell you for sure that the tornado had 142 mile an hour winds. We just don't, we just don't know that. The scale goes to five, five is as high as it goes. There's no such thing as an EF6 or anything like that. It goes to five and that anything that's a five is 200 miles an hour over. So if we had a tornado that was 300 miles an hour, it would be an EF5. So there's no such thing as anything higher than an EF5. In Oklahoma, uh, this is purely for Oklahoma. Your statistics locally will vary. The majority, almost 75% of the tornadoes are in that EF0 to EF1 range. That's great news because those are the weaker variety of tornadoes. Those are not typically the kinds of tornadoes that hurt people or kill people. Unfortunately, those are also the kinds of tornadoes that can form very, very quickly, sometimes we before we have a warning in effect. So there's good and bad with those. The tornadoes that you see most often on the news and you hear most often about the dramatic tornadoes, the EF4s and the EF5s are exceptionally rare. Even here in the heart of Tornado Alley in Oklahoma, less than 2% of tornadoes ever get that strong. So it's very un unlikely that anyone will ever see an EF4, EF5 tornado. Of course, they happen, but they're, they're very, very rare. Now, a myth busting thing here, you cannot look at a tornado and determine its intensity. You can't look at this tornado and say that is an EF3 tornado. You can't look at the size of the tornado. Size is not always a reliable indicator of intensity. Remember what the tornado is rated ultimately is based on what it hits. So if it doesn't hit anything, it doesn't matter how bad it looks or how fast the winds are blowing in it. If it doesn't hit something for us to rate it, to base a rating on, then it's not going to get a rating or it's going to get an, an unknown rating maybe. Um, so there's very often tornadoes that are probably capable of producing EF3, 4, 5 damage are in very, very rural areas and they don't hit anything to give an EF3, 4, or 5 rating. That's good news, that's a good thing, but we're, we're, we will never know for sure the intensity of every tornado because it all depends on what it encounters. Now we can't forecast tornado intensity either. We can't tell you uh, today there's gonna be an EF3 tornado, but we do know that certain weather conditions have a higher potential to produce tornadoes that are in that EF3, EF4, EF5 range. The National Weather Service meteorologists work at the Storm Prediction Center um, with the local offices are, are getting better at this. And, you know, we, we can say that this is a day where there's a potential for those stronger, more violent uh, tornadoes. Um, so that that's, that's one thing to remember is we can't really uh, forecast that. So like I said before, rating, the rating that the tornado gets, the EF0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is based on the tornado hitting something. Uh, and this is this this is these are the list of items that we use. So when I go out and do a damage survey, I have a an app on a, on an iPad that we use, and we have 28 different things that we look for in the field. A tornado has to hit one of these 28 things to be rated. Um, so it could be a tree, it could be the canopy on a gas station, it could be uh, a strip mall, it could be a single wide mobile home. And for each of these, there's a list of wind speeds that it takes to cause various levels of damage. Uh, but vehicles are not on the list. So we can't rate a tornado based on vehicles, for example. So anyway, we could, we could do a whole two hour training just on the EF scale alone. It's very interesting, but just know that the tornadoes are rated after the tornado happens and they're rated solely based on the damage that happens. Even if there's a wind measurement, that they're based only on the damage that happens. 
and here's an aerial view of of one one tornado. This is from um, I think this is from last year down in southeast Oklahoma. This is a mobile home, and and sometimes now uh, we're able to use drones or aerial photography to help us. Very often on damage surveys, it's hard to get where you need to get uh, the day after the tornado. So anyway. Um, Tornadoes are, are very scary and they're very dangerous storms. They're the most violent storms on earth. Um, so the job of spotters is to help us, help the people that are in the path of those, give us information before that tornado ever forms to let us know what's happening. And after, in just a minute, we're gonna start, I'm gonna get into more detail about how you can help us with that. But remember, if you don't remember anything else we talked about for the past 44 minutes, uh, safety first. Safety is the most important thing to remember through uh, this evening's training and as you're observing storms. So, all right, I'm going to stop here again. We got lots of good questions and keep them coming. There's no way I can get to them all. Um, let's see. Do violent tornadoes last longer than weaker ones? Sometimes they do. Uh, usually some of the longer lasting tornadoes are those bigger, more intense tornadoes. So that that is that is possible. We talked about ES6 tornadoes. There's no such thing. Does Tornado Zone ever move? I, I guess you're meaning Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is really, I mentioned it, but Tornado Alley is really wherever tornadoes happen. There's the, a traditional Tornado Alley here in the Plains. There's a Tornado Alley in the Southeastern United States. Don't, don't get too worried about where Tornado Alley is or where it moves or shifts. It's wherever tornadoes are happening. There's been no shortage of tornadoes here in the Southern Plains area, even with an increase of tornadoes in the Southeastern United States. Um, so you could potentially have an EF5 in a field, but it's rated EF0 because of the damage categories. Absolutely. Uh, the El Reno tornado from May 31st, 2013, um, it was 2.6 miles wide. We had two research radars that measured winds close to 300 miles an hour, but we could only rate the tornado on EF3 because that's all it damaged. Thankfully, it was in a very rural area and didn't hit any buildings that we could rate as a four or a five. So, um, so yeah, that that's that that can happen. All right, one common question I'm seeing is is is, is, is this going to be recorded? Unfortunately, we're not able to record this one, and I'm not able to share the slides. I'm not going to be able to share the slides of this. I'm going to give you some resources at the very end where you can go and get more information, and you can see some of the information that we shared here, but we're not not able to share the individual um, the individual slides. So, okay, I'm going to take a break here for. I'm gonna take about a 10 minute break. We're gonna come back. It is 717 central time here, and I'm gonna come back and start at 727. So uh, stretch your legs, type more questions in. I'm gonna look at questions during the break and maybe answer some more, uh, but we'll come back in 10 minutes and get going with, with really the meat of the presentation, what to look for in the clouds, supercells, wall clouds, tornadoes, funnel clouds, scud clouds, all that cool stuff. So we'll be back here in about 10 minutes. Right, we're going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. Not quite time yet, but I did want to just jump back on and getting lots and lots of good questions. And again, there's no way I'll ever be able to uh, answer all of those, but I did just want to acknowledge some while people are uh, virtually coming back in and sitting down before the well, we start again here in two minutes. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about downbursts here in just a second. They're not the same as a tornado. Uh, I'm in Durant, how, how at risk is my community. Uh, Durant has had its fair share of tornadoes. It's definitely a part of the country where you wanna pay close attention. Uh, you, there's, you're, you're subject to everything we're talking about here tonight from hail to wind to tornadoes to flooding. So Durant has one of the best storm spotter networks in the area and one of the best emergency management programs. So you're, you're fortunate uh, in, that, in that respect. So uh, welcome, to the, welcome to the area. Um, let's see, I can't get them all here, just choosing a few, uh, water spout versus a tornado, a water spout is a tornado on the water, basically, so if a tornado forms and moves over a lake, it can be a water spout, and then it can move on the land and be a tornado, so that, that, that's fairly, fairly basic, um, who do we call? Contact with reports. We'll talk about that here in a little while. Um, 
Let's see. Tornadoes are only classified by observed damage when the local National Weather Service office posts a storm damage path near scale. Actual tornado may have been constant. Uh, yeah, so when we when we do a damage survey, we try to piece together using all the evidence we have where the tornado started, where it ended. Sometimes we only have one picture, or sometimes we only have two reports, and we have to fill it in with the best we can with estimates from radar and, and other information that we have to fill in those gaps. So yeah, we, we always um, we always have to, when we're rating a tornado and putting the tornado in the official database, we have to have that basic uh, information. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked about dangers of CG lightning. We talked about that. That's that's lightning, cloud to ground lightning is dangerous. You need to be inside. Anywhere outside is unsafe when there's lightning uh, going on. Let's see. All right, we're going to get started back here. We still got quite a bit to go. We're going to go through it pretty quickly. I will remind you that there's no way you can be an expert in severe weather just after sitting through this. We're going to blast through this next part fairly quickly. It's an overview. It's, it's it's something to give you the basics of what you need to know. It's not enough for you to go out there and start being an expert spotter with years of experience, but it's, it's to give you the basics. And at the very end, I'm going to give you some resources where you can go and get and get more uh, information. All right, let's jump right into it. Break time is over. Let's talk about supercells. A supercell is a particular kind of thunderstorm. Uh, not every thunderstorm that we see even here in Oklahoma is a supercell storm. Supercell storms, the reason we focus so much on those in our storm spotter training is because those are the types of storms that typically produce the worst weather. The, the, the biggest hail comes from supercell storms. The most intense tornadoes come from supercell storms. You can get damaging winds. You can get all the bad weather from a supercell. Um, and the, one of the most important reasons we focus so much on supercells in storm spotter training is supercells have sometimes visual clues or cues that you can see as a spotter. There are things that you can see in the clouds with the supercell before there's ever a tornado there, for example. You can see the clouds behaving in a certain way that can give you an indication that a tornado might develop sometime in the next few minutes. And you telling us what you're seeing, those reports, those kinds of reports can help us get a warning out quicker. So that's what this is all about. Now, there's other kinds of thunderstorms and most, a lot of you, certain parts of the country, you may never ever see a supercell where we're guaranteed to see supercells here, no matter how slow the severe weather season, we're gonna have supercells here just about every year. Um, we're going to focus on those for a while here. And then again, uh, the reason is they're dangerous storms and there's actually things that we can look for in the clouds that can help us as warning forecasters to do a better job. So this is a, let me go back. This is a schematic kind of a cartoon picture of a supercell. And for the next several slides, when we're looking at supercell storms, we're going to be looking off to the Northwest. That's, that's, Given the direction that supercells typically move from the southwest to the northeast or from the west to the east, uh, the best viewing angle for supercells is typically down to the southeast of the storm. So most of the pictures, most of the animations, most of the, the, the training material that we have is taken looking up at a storm to the northwest. Now, you have to remember that storms don't always appear to the northwest like this, but we, we want you to be aware of the structure of a supercell. We want you to know where the wall cloud is most likely to happen, so you'll know that when you uh, know that when you see it. Um, so we're, that's what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes. We're not going to talk much about radar, but there is a radar representation of a of a supercell. And somebody before the break asked a question about a debris ball, that little round circular thing right there with some purple in it. That's a good example uh, of a debris ball. That was a a that's the May 20th, 2013 EF5 tornado with 220 mile an hour plus winds moving into more uh, Oklahoma. So that's what a debris ball looks like. Okay. Storms. Thunderstorms are processes. Thunderstorm is not a thing. It's not like a, you know, a block of wood floating down a stream or something. It's air and it's water. That's all it is. And it's constantly growing, changing, and evolving. 
thunderstorms all have two things in common. They all have an updraft, which is air moving up into the into the sky, and they have a downdraft, which is the cold, rainy air uh, coming down um, out of the clouds. Supercell thunderstorms that we're going to focus on here, they have an updraft. They have a downdraft, but the position of that updraft and downdraft is what make them very efficient producers of, of severe weather. So let me go hit the right button here. Okay. So with a supercell thunderstorm, the, the warm, moist air, that unstable air that you hear us talk about is the fuel supply for the storm. That's the gasoline that fuels the storm. The more unstable the air, then the faster that that updraft is going to rise up into the base of the storm, that air that's going straight up into the storm. So the more unstable it is, the faster that air rises, the faster that air rises, the storm is going to be taller. The taller the storm is, you know, that that's sometimes an indicator of how severe it is. In the most intense supercells, these storms can become 8, 10, 12 miles high straight up into the atmosphere, 60,000 feet or more with the very most intense supercells. You can also have supercells that are only 20,000 feet tall. The point is they have a very strong upward draft of air that's moving up. That's that warm, moist air that's in that's flowing in uh, to the storm. Every supercell, every thunderstorm, but every supercell also has a downdraft. When the precipitation forms in the storm, the rain forms, the hail forms, it cools the air around it. And that forms like a bubble of air. And that air is heavier than that warm air around it. So it wants to sink down to the ground and it will come down to the ground sometimes very, very quickly and it'll hit the ground and spread out in all directions. Somebody asked earlier about microburst or downburst. That's where a microburst or downburst happens is when that downdraft comes down out of the storm and hits the ground. Now, every single thunderstorm, no matter how weak or how strong, has a downdraft. To get a microburst or a downburst, which is a really intense, concentrated downdraft, you have to have just the right atmospheric conditions, the right mixture of instability and moisture and things like that. And in those situations, if you've got the right mixture, you can get winds over 100 miles an hour coming straight down out of the storm. So you can get 100, 110 mile an hour winds out of a storm without a tornado ever being there. Now in a supercell, it's important to know kind of where that updraft and downdraft typically are because where they meet, where they come together is usually where we see the most action in the storm. We call it the action area in storm spotting. Um, so the, the action area of the storm is that area of the storm. It's usually on the rear of the storm, the, the kind of the southwest edge of a typical supercell storm. The action area is the part where the updraft and the downdraft are very close together. If we're going to get a wall cloud, if we're going to get a tornado, it's almost always going to be in that area. That action area is also where the biggest hail typically forms in a storm. So we talked about that a little bit earlier, how we would, and we'll talk more about it here in just a second. So a couple of visual examples. Here's a storm up in Northwest Oklahoma from May of 2018. This is a supercell thunderstorm. We have an updraft area and we have a downdraft area. Uh, the updraft area is really on the left two thirds of the screen. Uh, you can see kind of brightish skies back behind there. The cloud, the bottom of the cloud is not perfectly flat, but that's our updraft. That's where the air is flowing into the storm. So if we're looking up toward the Northwest at this, if this is a typical supercell kind of day, we've probably got very strong winds that are blowing at our back from the southeast right into that storm. And that warm air is the fuel for the storm. It rises up into the updraft and goes up into the storm. On the right hand, about third of the screen, that's a downdraft. And you can see the very big difference in the character of how that looks. It's a very murky, uh, it's not sharp edges, it's very fuzzy looking. That is all the rain and the hail and the wind uh, that's coming out uh, out of the bottom of the storm. Now, every thunderstorm has an updraft, every th thunderstorm has a downdraft. The reason we focus on them with supercells is that is your clue. When you're spotting and you're dealing with the supercell, if you can identify where the updraft and the downdraft areas are and where they kind of meet together, that's going to help you zoom in on the area that you need to be paying the closest attention to. 
Here's another example of a supercell. This is uh, looks a little bit different. The the updraft area is kind of on the on the left third of the screen over there, and there's a downdraft area right in the middle. These thunderstorms, supercell thunderstorms, not only do they ha have air rising up into them off the ground, but that air is also rotating because of the wind shear in the storm, because the winds are often blowing much, much faster at the top of the storm than they are down near the ground. This helps that storm to rotate and the storm has that rotation. That's actually what we see on radar. If we talk about a developing tornado on radar, we don't usually see the tornado itself. We see that rotation in that in that part of the supercell uh, where the tornado is forming. We'll get more to that in, uh, in just a second. Here's another example. This is a supercell looking off to the northwest. And we'll kind of label some of the parts here. This is our updraft. The updraft is on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, that is the flat cl cloud base there. That's where the, where the air is rising up into the base of the storm. So that is our updraft area. And there's what we call the rain-free base. The rain-free base is usually on the backside of one of these classic supercell storms. And the reason it's rain-free is because all of that is air that's rising straight up off the ground into the thunderstorm itself. Over on the right-hand side of the screen is the downdraft area. And then right where those two things come together, you can see a cloud that looks like it's almost touching the ground there in the middle. That's a wall cloud. And a wall cloud is something very, very important we're going to talk about in detail here uh, in just a minute. Okay, so you've got a sense maybe kind of very, very quickly and basically of what a supercell might look like in, in real life, in person, standing on the ground, looking at it. And we want to touch a little bit on what it might look like on radar because we talked about using radar to help you be safe and to have, help you uh, know what's going on. Uh, here's here's a, a representation of a supercell on radar. So this is the same kind of storm. We're just looking at it from straight. Imagine we're way up high looking straight down on it. The right-hand side is a, is a radar image of a supercell thunderstorm. There's an example of that debris ball again. Um, the left-hand side is kind of how that matches up with the, the kind of the schematic diagram of a, a supercell. So the supercell is kind of, the, the precipitation is kind of sorted out. The lighter rain is typically on the edges of it. The heavier rain, the hail, and the very largest hail are almost always going to be back on that back side of the storm. So there on the left-hand side, where you see it labeled hail, and you see that red circle there with the arrows on it, that is where that area of rotation is the strongest in the supercell. That's what we call a mesocyclone. And a mesocyclone is something that radar um, meteorologists look for. And when we issue a tornado warning based on radar, that's what we're issuing the warning based on. It's not the tornado. It's that mesocyclone. It's that strong rotation area inside that supercell. And very often, you will see what we call a hook echo on radar. Now, a hook echo happens quite a bit. And just because you see a hook on radar does not mean there's a tornado there. The reason the hook echo is there is because that red circle, look on the left-hand side of the screen here, that left circle, there's a counterclockwise circulation or rotation going on right there. It's so strong that it's actually pulling some of that rain and hail around the back side of it. So the radar is actually picking up some of that rain and hail around the back side. That's why it looks like a hook on the back of it. So a hook doesn't mean there's a tornado there. It means there's rotation there and that there could be um, could be a, uh, a tornado. All right, let's, let's, we're going to slice this uh, in a little bit more detail. It's important to kind of know the parts and pieces of a supercell to help you know what you're looking at uh, as a spotter. So let, let's break it into chunks here. This is that same supercell looking from above. This is just the cloud. So we're going we're gonna to start with that. Uh, every uh, supercell has an updraft. The updraft is going to be on the back side of the storm. If it's our typical southwest to northeast moving supercell, that, that updraft is going to be on the southwest part of the storm. Every updraft has to have a downdraft. So the downdraft is what you see on radar, essentially. The, the downdraft is the precipitation, the rain and the hail that's coming out of the storm. So that downdraft is going to kind of look like that hook echo. Uh, Again, from above, that, that's our downdraft area. Uh, and the heaviest rain, the biggest hail is going to be very, very close to that updraft area. If there's going to be big, giant hail, baseball-sized hail or something like that, it's going to be very, very close 
right down to where that red and the blue meet there on the very southwest edge of the storm. That's the most likely area for big hail. That's also where what we call the mesocyclone is, is located. This is the tight, intense counterclockwise circulation that's in the storm. This is something that Doppler radar can see. Doppler radar can't see the tornado itself most of the time, but it can see this mesocyclone, this rotating updraft inside the supercell. Now the supercell is gonna have a strong flow of air into it. Now, the stronger the inflow into the storm, that warm, moist air, remember that's the fuel supply for the storm, that can keep that storm going. And it's also gonna have outflow. It's gonna have cold, rainy air coming down out of the storm. Now for a supercell to be dangerous, for a supercell to be tornadic, to produce a tornado, a supercell has to have just the perfect balance of the updraft and downdraft being just close enough together, but not too close. And it has to have the right mixture of inflow and outflow. If there's too much air flowing down and out of the storm and not enough air flowing into it, then the storm is gonna get its fuel supply cut off and it's not gonna be able to last very long. Um, so that you have to have a really delicate balance. It's hard to get a tornado. As a spotter, you should never go out expecting to see a tornado or looking for a tornado. It's very, very difficult to get all the ingredients to come together to produce any kind of tornado. Uh, it's, it's a very delicate balance that you, that you have to have there. Okay, so we're gonna zoom in now. We're gonna go back down to ground level and start looking at the storm right there where that mesocyclone is, right there on the backside of the storm, right in the action area is a very important feature that we're gonna focus on here for a couple of minutes called a wall cloud. Now, a wall cloud is a, an abrupt, distinct lowering of the base of the thunderstorm cloud. So you've got that rain-free base, that kind of flat base on the back of the storm. The wall cloud is very often, uh, it's, a, it's part of the cloud that's lower than the clouds around it. Um, now, it's not just any little tiny piece of a cloud that's slightly lower than the clouds around it it's usually pretty abrupt and, and pretty distinct. How it appears is gonna depend on lots of things, your viewing angle and the time of day and the amount of moisture, how high the cloud bases are off the ground and all those kinds of things. There's gonna have, there, you know, there's a hundred different ways a wall cloud can look, uh, but that's basically what we're looking for. The wall cloud has to be connected to the bottom of the storm. If the cloud is floating around underneath the storm and it's not connected, that's not a wall cloud. There's things that look like a wall cloud that are not. Um, a wall cloud is going to be on that back side of the storm where that mesocyclone, that rotating updraft typically is. And the wall cloud is usually, if it's gonna be dangerous, it's usually gonna have organized, sustained motion around a vertical axis. I'll show you what that means here in just a second. So let's zoom back out. Let's look at our diagram or our cartoon picture of a supercell thunderstorm. Again, looking toward the Northwest, our updrafts on the left side, our downdrafts on the right side, the action area is that red square. The wall cloud is going to be right there where the updraft and the downdraft come together. And again, looking at a radar image, that's going to be in that red circular area on the very, very back side of the storm. If you look at thunderstorms long enough, you're gonna see things that look like a wall cloud. And very often what people confuse for a wall cloud is something called a shelf cloud. And that is a, a shelf cloud is, is seen on the front side of a thunderstorm. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. There's two totally different things. Um, and um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a second. Let's look at a couple of pictures of wall clouds. This is a, a wall cloud again up in far Northwest Oklahoma, May 29th of 2018. This is a distinct abrupt lowering of the cloud base. We're real, really zoomed in tight here, but looking at radar, I can tell you this was a supercell thunderstorm. It did have a mesocyclone, it was rotating. We are looking at the Southwest part of the storm. The downdraft, even though we really can't see it, is off to the right-hand side of the screen there. We're looking at the updraft part of the storm and the wall cloud has formed right there where the most intense air is flowing uh, into that thunderstorm. Doesn't mean there's a tornado that's gonna happen, even if you see a wall cloud, but uh, if you see a wall cloud, that is a step toward a tornado happening, maybe. Here's another example, a very dramatic picture of a, of a wall cloud. The downdraft is on the right-hand side of the screen where that, that lightning strike is. The updraft is on the left-hand side. The wall cloud is that lowered cloud base right there in the middle. 
that's lower down than the rest of the base uh, of the thunderstorm. And here's another uh, example of a wall cloud here. Um, remember what we've got going on here at the ground level. We've got very warm air flowing into the thunderstorm along the ground. We've got a very, very strong updraft that's happening in the storm, very intense motion that's coming straight up off the ground into the storm. The wall cloud forms where the updraft is the most intense. So that's really where sometimes you can have air moving straight up into the storm at 100 miles an hour in that general uh, area. The wall cloud forms very, very close to the downdraft area. And in fact, that's why the wall cloud is there. Wall cloud is, a, is, is there because just, there's just the right mixture of downdraft air, cold, rainy air next to that warm, humid air that's rising quickly. That's where the wall cloud forms. You're not going to see a wall cloud on the front of a thunderstorm. You're going to see the wall cloud on the back side of a supercell uh, thunderstorm. All right, getting lots of good, good comments and questions. Again, I'm not going to be able to cover them all. I'm going to stop here in just a minute. To, to look at a few of those, but keep those coming if you have anything you want to ask. Okay, so we've talked about supercells. We talked about the action area. We know that the action area is where we're going to be looking for the wall cloud. Now we've got a wall cloud. What do we need to be looking for as far as is this wall cloud going to produce a tornado? Well, storm spotting is very much about looking at things in motion and looking at things how looking at how things are changing over time. We're looking at a lot of still pictures here. This is a snapshot of a wall cloud. We're not seeing any motion. We can't see the clouds moving. We don't know what this wall cloud looked like five minutes ago or what it's gonna look like in 15 minutes, but that's what's most important with storm spotting is the trends and how things are changing. If you're observing a wall cloud, it's very important to notice what's going on now. It's important to say, hey, I've got a wall cloud here, but that's not enough. If you can do so safely, you need to also tell us Okay, what's it look like now, two minutes later? What's it look like five minutes later? For a wall cloud to be increasing its potential to produce a tornado, these are the kinds of things we look for in a wall cloud. We look for uh, the wall cloud being lower to the ground. So if the wall cloud was kind of high up at first and then 10 minutes later, it's gotten bigger or it's gotten lower to the ground, that's a danger sign. If there's rotation in the wall cloud, clouds moving around in a circle, and it's faster than it was before, that's a danger sign. If that circulation is getting tighter, so sometimes you'll look at a, a bottom of a supercell thunderstorm and there's very slow rotation in a big area at the bottom of the storm. But when a wall cloud is getting closer to producing a tornado, often you'll see it kind of tightening, the rotation area getting smaller. So imagine a wedding cake, a four-tiered wedding cake. The big tier is on the bottom and then they get smaller, smaller, smaller. If we flip that wedding cake upside down, that's kind of what we're talking about with the rotation. There's a big area of slow rotation in the thunderstorm, then a smaller area below it that's faster and a smaller area below it that's faster. That wall cloud, when it's tightening up and getting faster rotation, that's a danger sign. So if you're a spotter and you're observing this kind of thing, it's very important to tell us I see a wall cloud, it's, the rotation has increased over the last 10 minutes. It's much lower to the ground, the this, this circulation has tightened. That is important information to us that we can compare with radar data to know, okay, this storm may be getting closer uh, to produce a tornado. But it's just as important to tell us when the tornado potential is going down. So if you see that the, the wall cloud was low to the ground, but now it's higher up, the rotation was strong, but now it's weaker, or the, or the circulation was tight, now it's broadening. Those are all signs that the tornado potential is decreasing. It's just as important to tell us that as it is to tell us that it's getting closer to producing a tornado. We don't want to issue tornado warnings if we don't have to. So let us know what's happening. Report those trends to us and let us know exactly what it is you're seeing. One more uh, item here, we're gonna take a quick break for questions. We talk about rotation in, in supercell thunderstorms and in wall clouds. The rotation that we're talking about is, is sustained, organized motion around a vertical axis. So on your screen there, you should see that yellow uh, vertical bar there, and you may see a red arrow kind of snaking its way around it. That's what we're talking about with rotation. So if we're looking at a wall cloud, uh, or a funnel cloud 
Imagine that that white cylinder there is a funnel cloud or a wall cloud. What we're looking for is motion that's in a circle all the way around that. So on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you're looking for cloud motion that indicates a circle, a circular motion. So we're, imagine we're standing out in a field looking at the base of this thunderstorm. Those lighter gray colored clouds are moving from the left to the right. If you can see that, I know it's a little choppy maybe on your screen. The cloud, the darker color clouds on the screen are moving from the right to the left. You can imagine that that indicates an area of rotation. There's a circular motion uh, going on there with that with that area of rotation. That's what rotation is. Uh, rotation is is not just clouds moving in the sky. Clouds are moving in the sky all the time. Uh, there may be low hanging, scary looking clouds that are moving that 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 look very ominous, but that's not rotation. Rotation is this. Rotation is air or clouds moving around uh, in a circle. Okay, we got a ton of good questions here. I'm going to skim through some of them. I'm not going to be able to get them all. Sorry. Uh, okay, we're going to get into identifying tornadoes in a minute. Um, spotter network. Spotter network is a great tool. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Some of these questions are better for the advanced class, which is tomorrow night. If you're interested in taking the advanced storm spotter class, which will get more into the meteorology and more into some of the questions you guys are answer asking, that is tomorrow night, 6.30. You have to register separately. So just because you registered for this one, that doesn't mean you're registered for the other one. There's a link that's on our social media and on our website to, to register for that. So if you can do if you can do this again tomorrow night for two hours, that's a really, really good class. And we'll get into some of this stuff y'all are talking about here, like QLCS tornadoes. We really don't have um, a lot of time to talk about that or rear inflow notches. Um, are scud clouds a good indication of rotation by the wall cloud? Yeah, we're going to talk about scud clouds in a minute, but it's those little detached filaments, fragments of clouds underneath, and sometimes you can use those to tell if there is rotation uh, under the under the storm. Uh, why does the wall cloud extend below the base of the supercell? Uh, it extends below the base of the supercell because what's happening is, we're going back to this, this animation here, uh, the updraft, those red arrows that are going up into the base of the storm, that's actually pulling in some of that really humid air. Those blue arrows over there are the downdraft and all that murky area back in there, that's really cool, humid air that's raining back in there. There's hail in there and it's cooled air and it's really humid. So when that humid air gets lifted up by the updraft, it actually helps to form the wall cloud. So the wall cloud, we talk about it lowering out of the base of the storm, but a lot of times what's really happening is the wall cloud is forming almost from the ground up and connecting to the bottom of the storm. So the wall cloud forms as that very moist air is lifted by those, those that updraft and forms in that, in that area. Um, let's see, a couple more questions here. Uh, do QLCS tornadoes form from wall clouds? Uh, QLCS tornadoes, again, I think we're going to get into more of that tomorrow night in the advanced class. They don't really form from wall clouds, so this won't really help you uh, much with those. Um, are you still using MPing? We'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, but again, we'll talk about this at the, at the end, but the advanced class tomorrow night, very much recommended if you can participate, but you do need to register again. Okay, let's get back to where we were here. We talked about wall clouds. Now let's get into funnel clouds. If there's gonna be a tornado, the next step in the process is typically a funnel cloud. A funnel cloud is a funnel shaped cloud of condensed water droplets associated with a rotating column of wind extending from the base of a cloud, but not reaching the ground. So this is another way to think of it. This is a violently rotating column of air. It's connected to the base of the cloud but it is not um, uh, on, in contact with the ground. So that's what a funnel cloud is. Just because you have a cloud shaped like a funnel does not mean it's a funnel cloud. A funnel cloud is a circulation. It's in the action area, the back part of that storm. It may or may not, there may or may not be an obvious wall cloud that's coming down out of most of the time there is, but the funnel cloud is going to have certain characteristics. It has to be connected uh, to the cloud base. That's a requirement. If it's a little piece of cloud that's not connected to the bottom of the storm, it's not not probably a funnel cloud because it's, you know, this is where it got the name funnel cloud. It usually has a funnel shape. Sometimes it looks like a tapered cone. The edges are sometimes smooth-ish. 
So it's not going to be a perfect, you know, straight line funnel um, like you see sometimes, you know, drawn dr when people draw a tornado. But it, it's it's you're going to be able to see that. And one of the most important things to look for is rotation. Remember, remember what rotation means. What we just talked about rotation is that organized, sustained motion around that vertical axis. So if you see something that you think is a funnel cloud, it it has to be connected to the cloud base. It's it's going to be a funnel shape and it's going to be rotating and it's not going to be in contact with the ground or you're, there's going to be no apparent contact with the ground. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's in contact with the ground uh, or not. So that's a funnel cloud. Again, there's lots of things out there that look like funnel clouds, but these are the key things that you look for. OK, let's get into tornado. Well, let's don't get into tornadoes. Let's talk about tornadoes. Tornado. Here's the definition. It's a violently rotating column of air. It's in contact with the ground and it's extending from a thunderstorm cloud. So there's three pieces of that definition and there's three important words highlighted in yellow, air, ground, and cloud. The tornado is made of air and water droplets and dust and debris. So because it's made of air, the tornado is, 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 the, is, the, um, is the wind, it's not the cloud. The tornado itself is that rotating column of air. It has to be in contact with the ground and it has to be extending down from a thunderstorm cloud. If it doesn't meet all three of those parts of the definition, then it's not a tornado. Um, so that, that's, that's the basics of what we're looking for. Um, things to think about when reporting a tornado. There's a lot of lookalikes out there. Uh, can you see the cloud base and can you see the ground under it? Uh, the two examples on the left hand, on the right hand side of the screen, those two big tornadoes, it's pretty obvious that those are tornadoes. We can see the cloud base, we can see the ground pretty much underneath it. We have confidence that, that that's in contact with the ground. We can sometimes see debris uh, being thrown up. So that that's a good, that's, you have to have that evidence to say for sure it's a tornado. Is it connected to the cloud base? Is it in contact with the ground? Those are key parts of the definition. Is it in the right part of the storm where tornadoes develop? Sometimes tornado lookalikes will happen on the front or the leading edge of a thunderstorm and people get very excited by these low hanging clouds, but that's not where a tornado is really gonna develop. It's gonna be on the backside of a thunderstorm. Is it rotating? Can you see any debris underneath uh, the storm? And you know, most of us will never see a tornado. We have people here in Oklahoma, we have somebody that's worked in our office who's been in the weather service for decades who's lived here all his life who's never seen a tornado so it's not like you know they're they're that common even as a storm spotter even storm chasers go out every year and, and never see a tornado so uh, they're not that common uh, but when you're when you see something that you think is a tornado it's important to keep these things in mind and remember when you're reporting a tornado if you get a if you get a situation where you're actually seeing a tornado uh, to be report exactly what you see if you can't tell for sure that it's in contact with the ground because there's trees in the way, tell us that. Say, I've got a rotating funnel cloud. It's extending down from a wall cloud. I'm looking toward the Northwest. I can't tell if it's in contact with the ground because there's trees or buildings or hills or something in my way. That's a good report. We don't want you to guess or try to figure out what might be happening. We just want you to report exactly uh, what you see. Okay. Most of the time, we're not going to be dealing with tornadoes, though. Most of the time when we're spotting, and this applies wherever you are. We had this going on today around here with thunderstorms that we had in the freezing air, is scud clouds. Scud clouds are little pieces of clouds, filaments of clouds, fragments of clouds. They happen any time anytime we have showers and thunderstorms. They don't mean the storm is severe. They're just clouds. And, and a lot of times, though, if, especially if they're, they're happening around a thunderstorm, they can get into shapes and configurations and things like that that make them look like they could be a tornado or they could be a funnel cloud or a wall cloud. This is a, a still image here of, of some scud clouds. Um, if we saw this moving, if, if we were standing here on the edge of this lake looking at this, one of the things that would give this be a dead giveaway, this was a scud cloud, is that there would be no rotation. And sometimes there's little or no movement with these scud clouds. This is just like a dead 
piece of cloud just kind of hanging there. Or if it's moving at all, it's blowing in one direction as the wind blows it. It's not organized. It's not focused in a little tight spiral area like a tornado would be. It's just kind of there. Now, there can be lookalikes that look very ominous. This is a scud cloud. This is during a severe weather event, I think on May in May of 2019 out in Western Oklahoma. This was submitted on social media as a picture of a tornado, but this is a scud cloud. That, that thing back there between the two trees is not a tornado. Now, how in the world do you know that? Well, it's hard to tell from the still picture, but if we're there at the baseball field with these uh, excited kids here getting their game interrupted by the storm, uh, we'd be watching this feature very closely. We would immediately see that it's not rotating. It's not organized. It's either just kind of hanging there in that shape or it's probably just, we probably caught it at a moment where it just has that look and five minutes later it may have just completely evaporated and disappeared. So when we're looking at things that we think might be a tornado, remember what we're looking for. We're looking for that organization. Does it make sense where it is? Is does it is that where a tornado would be in this storm? And again, that's where radar can come in very handy. It can help you to know, okay, this cloud that I'm looking at, that storm out there, I'm not look I'm when I look at my radar, what I'm seeing based on my viewing angle, as I'm looking at the front of a thunderstorm that's way out there to the west of me. That's not where a tornado is gonna be. That's not where you're gonna see it. It's gonna be on the back side of the storm. So that's how you can use radar to help you. Here's another dramatic example. I think this one's from Alabama, but this is again, it's, you know, looking at a still picture, that looks pretty scary. That looks pretty ominous. ominous. And imagine what this would look like at 10.30 at night with lightning flashing behind it with the tornado siren sounding. Uh, that would be very, very tempting to get very excited and call that a tornado. But again, we need to know what part of the storm we're looking at. We need to see how organized that cloud feature is. Is it rotating? Is it, is it, is it where it's supposed to be? And does it make sense for a, uh, for a tornado to, to be there? All right, let me pause real quick and see if we have any other uh, quick questions before we move on. Does the funnel cloud connect to the wall cloud? Yeah, usually the funnel cloud is going to connect, probably connect to the wall cloud or at least the base of the storm. If the, for the most classic tornado situations, you're going to have the wall cloud, then the funnel cloud comes out of the wall cloud, and then the funnel cloud reaches the ground, and then it becomes uh, a tornado. Okay, so scud clouds are very common, and that's something we see anytime there's showers or thunderstorms in the area and they can be tornado lookalikes. Another thing that can be tornado lookalikes are shelf clouds. And we talked about shelf clouds uh, just a second ago. And we're gonna show you some visual examples of those. A shelf cloud is a large cloud feature that forms usually on the leading edge of a thunderstorm. So when we talk about supercells and tornadoes and wall clouds, those wall clouds and tornadoes are usually on the back of the storm. So if the storm's coming towards you, it's not going to be the first thing you see. A shelf cloud is the first thing you see when a storm is coming towards you, especially if it's a big line of thunderstorms. And the shelf cloud tells you where the outflow is in the storm. The shelf cloud forms where it does because that's where the air is coming down out of the ground, coming down out of the cloud and hitting the ground. It's coming down out of the storm, hitting the ground, and then spreading out. And that forms the shelf cloud. What's the difference between a shelf cloud and a wall cloud? Well, the shelf cloud is gonna form where the outflow is in the storm. The shelf cloud is also gonna be much bigger than the wall cloud. The wall cloud is gonna be a compact, more distinct, abrupt, little lowered part of the cloud. The shelf cloud may take up the whole horizon as you look at it. And the shelf clouds can have some of the most dramatic appearances of any cloud you've seen. It looks like the end of the world or a, a, you know, a disaster movie or something where the aliens are coming. These big, low-hanging clouds that just take up the whole horizon. This is a shelf cloud, and it's not dangerous. It's not something that needs to be reported. It's nothing that's necessarily going to produce severe weather. One of the things that shelf clouds can do is they can help you identify the downdraft or the, the outflow part of the storm. And if a shelf cloud is coming towards you, very often, if there's going to be strong or damaging winds in a thunderstorm, they're going to be very close to that shelf cloud area. But a shelf cloud is nothing you need to report to us uh, or tell us it's there. It's kind of like a miniature cold front coming down out of the storm. 
Here's another example that kind of shows you really vividly the how a shelf cloud is the leading edge. We're kind of almost underneath the shelf cloud here. So the shelf cloud is that feature over on the right hand side where it kind of curves there over the road. Uh, all of that on the left hand side behind that, that murky looking greenish grayish colored sky, that's all downdraft. That's all hail and wind and heavy rain coming down out of the out of the storm and hitting the ground. That shelf cloud is moving this storm is moving from the left to the right so that shelf cloud is kind of like a miniature cold front so as that front moves along if you're standing over here on the right side of the road it may be you know in the 80s with the southeast wind but as soon as that shelf cloud gets overhead and especially that downdraft area hits you it's going to be heavy rain and a 20 degree temperature drop and gusty winds so that the shelf cloud is important to look for but it's nothing bad by itself the shelf cloud the Rain doesn't necessarily come directly out of the shelf cloud, it comes behind it. A very dramatic and striking looking cloud that we see that can sometimes be mistaken for something dangerous is something we call mammatus clouds. Mammatus clouds are these pouches or bubbles that form underneath a thunderstorm. They can look scary and ominous, but these form typically very, very high off the ground. So these are tens of thousands of feet above the ground where a wall cloud or a tornado are just going to be maybe a few hundred feet above the ground. Mamatis clouds are not dangerous. They do not indicate that a storm is severe. They do not indicate that tornadoes are possible. Mamatis are just indicate a lot of turbulence underneath a thunderstorm. And again, these, th these Mamatis clouds, you'll sometimes see them before a thunderstorm gets to you. They're underneath the anvil or that flat top part of the thunderstorm or they'll sometimes be after the storm has passed, but they're, they're nothing to worry about. They're nothing uh, dangerous or nothing needs to be reported. They're just very, very, uh, they can be very photogenic, very picturesque if you capture them. Now, everything that we've talked about so far is talking about storm spotting during the day when you can see everything. And even here in Oklahoma, we don't get all of our storms at night. Some of our worst storms in recent years have been well after dark. So how do you do all this? this at night? How do you spot a wall cloud and how do you look for rotation and organization if it's black dark? Well, it's very, very difficult. And it, if, if storm spotting during the day is dangerous, storm spotting at night is 100 times more dangerous because there's a lot more uh, uncertainty. There's a lot more questions about how far away something is and a lot more ways that you can get yourself in serious trouble if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing at night. Really, the storms look the same at night. They look exactly the same as they do during the day. It's just that we can't see all the features. Two things that we use at night, especially when we're talking about tornadoes, one of the things is lightning. If lightning is, is happening frequently enough in a thunderstorm and in the right part of the storm, then we may be able to use lightning to help us. Lightning may actually illuminate a funnel cloud or it may illuminate a wall cloud, or in this case, it illuminated a, a violent, nearly a violent tornado that was moving through um, over east of Durant, Oklahoma on April 30th of last year. This tornado killed uh, two people and it was a very, very large, substantial tornado. Uh, this was happening well after dark and the only pictures of it, where this was one of the few pictures of the tornado itself, is the only reason we got that is because lightning flashed behind the clouds, behind the tornado and kind of backlit it and we saw that. So lightning can light up parts of the cloud, cloud base, the, cl the, the bottom of the storm for us to help us see the wall cloud, help us see the funnel cloud, but it's almost impossible to tell if it's rotating at night. It's very, very difficult. It's very, very dangerous. So just know that the storms are the same at night, but they're very difficult to spot and see. So that's, you know, you, you don't want to jump in your car and run out there to go look at a storm after dark if you don't know what you're doing and don't have you know, multiple people helping you with radar data and things like that. It can be very, very uh, dangerous. Another tool that we can use at night for to identify severe weather is something called a power flash. Now, we've seen a lot of power flashes here in Oklahoma in the past 48 hours. We've had a devastating ice storm going on with uh, ice, sometimes two inches of ice on power lines or tree limbs causing power to go out. And a power flash happens just when there's an arc from a shorted out power line. Something causes the two power lines to touch and that causes an arc and that's that bluish, greenish, whitish, uh, explosive burst of color that you see 
uh, from these. It has nothing to do with a tornado. A power flash doesn't mean there's a tornado there. A lot of times in the springtime, people get very excited. There's a supercell, there's a, a wall cloud, there's a tornado warning, and then we start seeing power flashes and there's an automatic assumption that it has to be a tornado that's causing it. All a, a power flash doesn't tell you there's a tornado by itself. It just tells you that there is something is causing the lines to arc. It could be wind, it could be ice, We've had power flashes and earthquakes. We've had power flashes because somebody hits a, a, a light or electrical pole and causes the lines to touch. There's been power flashes when a poor uh, squirrel gets uh, resting across live wires and causes it. A power flash can be important in severe weather if you can combine it with other evidence. So a power flash is nothing to get overly excited about in and of itself, but if you have a funnel cloud, or if you have a wall cloud with rotation and you see a power flash underneath that area of rotation and it's consistent with where, if there was a tornado, where that tornado might be touching the ground, that can help confirm a tornado if, if there's other clues present. But you should never assume that a power flash means there's a tornado. Um, that, that's not what a power flash is. So that's important to know. Okay, let me stop here for some uh, questions. Has there ever been a supercell tornado that occurred near the storm's leading edge? Is it truly impossible for a tornado to form? Um, I don't know. And whether I've learned to never say never and never say always. So I will never say something's impossible with, with tornadoes and supercells. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So I'm not saying it can never happen, but the most common thing we're going to see with a supercell is that tornado developing back on the backside of the uh, backside of the storm. Um, a modest clouds are not an indicator of hail within the cloud. That has nothing to do with it. It just means there's turbulence there. Now, very often, a modest clouds may be with a supercell. So I've been in some hailstorms and I've seen modest clouds, but modest clouds don't mean there's going to be a hailstorm. Those two don't, they, they don't have to go uh, together like that. Um, let's see, we're going to talk about imping in a second. Is it possible that supercells can be embedded within uh, squall line, yes, a uh, squall line, we didn't talk about those, but a squall line is a line of thunderstorms. So instead of just being one storm by itself, it's a whole line of them. They happen all the time. And you can get supercells. You can get a line of supercells, three or four supercells that are all lined up in a row, or you can get a line of thunderstorms with a supercell kind of embedded in it. I think we get into that a little bit more in the advanced training this tomorrow night. Uh, not not enough time to get into detail in that here uh, this evening. All right, now let's get into the kind of the final stretch here, how to report and what to report. There are many different ways that you can report severe weather. Now this is where it gets very specific to our area. If you're in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Montana, Tennessee, Texas, you know, this is not going to apply to you. If you're interested in being a storm spotter in your area, you need to find out you specifically need to find out for yourself who you report to and how they want those reports to come in. Just about any National Weather Service office will take reports. You can report to them on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, if they have a phone line that they answer, you can report to them that way. There's different ways to get that information to them, but you need to know in your community, in your county, in your state, how to report. I'm gonna tell you how to report here in central and western Oklahoma and western North Texas but know that this won't apply to you necessarily. Uh, one of the things that you can do here, if you're in central western Oklahoma, western North Texas, you can call us on the phone. This phone is answered 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Uh, sometimes that may take us a little while to answer it, but this is a phone anybody can call. You can call and tell us you're a trained storm spotter and give us your report. Be as uh, short and succinct as possible, give as much detail as possible. We don't ask for a code number or a secret password, or we don't give out spotter IDs or anything like that. Tell us you're a trained storm spotter, where you are, what you're looking at, and what you got. That's all that you need uh, to know. Uh, spotter Network, we touched on this briefly earlier. Spotter Network is a very valuable resource. Spotternetwork.org, anyone can go and join Spotter Network. Now, what this is, is this is going to give you a username that will give you access to submit reports very quickly. You can submit reports using your phone. You can submit reports um, by, you know, just filling out a quick form. 
to be to become a member of Spotter Network, you have to take a very brief Storm Spotter training class, similar to what we're doing here, much shorter than this. And then you have to take a brief quiz. It's very simple. If you pay half attention tonight, you'll do you'll do great on it. After that, you'll have a username, you'll have a password, and then you'll be able to send spot, uh, spotter reports directly to the National Weather Service. These spotter reports reports come immediately into an internal chat room that we have so we see those automatically and if you have it tied into your like your location services on your phone for example you don't have to figure out if you're five miles southwest of Duran or six miles east southeast of this town it will automatically plot your location for you so uh, I don't have time to talk a lot about that a lot but I highly recommend Spotter Network we have a close working relationship it is an official partner of the National Weather Service, so it's legit and something we encourage you to use. Uh, we have amateur radio here in the office. Um, WX5OUN is our station call sign. Um, we're not on amateur radio as much as we used to be. It's still a very valuable tool. Lots of local spotter groups use amateur radio, uh, but it is a, a way to get in touch with us, and th there's more information about that uh, on our website. Now those are all the green shaded uh, ways to report. That means those are sometimes the best ways. Another way, kind of the yellow shaded approach is, is uh, one is Twitter. If you're on Twitter, you can submit reports to us fairly easily. Just be sure and tell us where you are, what you're looking at. If you can include a picture or video, that's great too. But just give us all the information that you would give us in a basic uh, report. There's something else called MPing. MPing is a, an, a, is an app that you can install on your mobile device. It is M-P-I-N-G, and it's a, a service that was developed by the National Severe Storms Laboratory, our neighbors, our neighbors right across the hall here in the building. And this is a, a tool that was developed initially to help radar researchers to know what kind of precipitation was falling from a storm. But now with MPing, you can report tornadoes, you can report damage, you can report flooding, you can report sleet, freezing rain, all that stuff we talked about earlier. And it's a very simple process. It's anonymous. So once you install the MPing app on your phone and you enable the location services, I sent several MPing reports over the past couple of days with the freezing rain and sleet. You just go through and pick, okay, I want to submit a sleet report. You hit it. You don't have to type in your name. You don't have to have an ID. You don't have to give your location. It knows your location. And we use those reports a lot. Now, they're anonymous, and sometimes we get some crazy reports in there, but usually the good reports far outweigh any bad ones that are out there. So MPing is a good tool uh, to use. You can email us reports. We do not encourage it. Uh, you know, the email is a horrible way to give us a tornado report or some urgent life and death report, for example. Uh, email is a great way to, eat, to give us pictures. Or if you call us on the phone and report hail to us, then you can say, hey, can I email you some pictures? Or I got great video of this wall cloud. Can I send it to you? There's our email address where you can send that. And this is all on our, on our web page as well. Facebook is not the best, um, well, for a lot of reasons, but for storm reporting, um, we get storm reports on Facebook, but it's it's very, very difficult sometimes to find them. Sometimes they can be a private message. Sometimes they could be a comment on a post. Sometimes they can be a post themselves. We do go look on Facebook quite a bit for um, reports, but it's very cumbersome. So if you have other ways to get us reports, if you can do it any one of these other ways, Facebook should be the last resort uh, for getting us reports. Okay, how to report. Now let's talk about what to report. Uh, we need to know what you saw, and I'm going to be specific about that, that here in just a second, tornado, flooding, hail, wind. Uh, give us specifics about what it is, how big was it, how fast was the wind blowing, is there any damage, and then let us know if you're doing a wind report, for example, is it estimated or measured? We'll talk more about that uh, in a second. We need to know when it happened. If it's happening right now, let us know that. If it happened an hour ago, let us know that. We need to know where it happened. So this is one of the most important things and where we have the most trouble sometimes is getting good location information. The best thing to do is to think of it in terms of us trying to find your report on a state highway map. So if you tell us I've got a golf ball size hail five miles northeast of Watonga, I can pretty much find that on a map. I, I know where that is approximately. 
uh, you can give us a latitude and longitude of where the event happened if you want to. We can type that in and find that pretty quickly now. Um, but don't be too specific. If you say, yeah, I'm just, you know, okay, if you know Watonga, I'm outside of Watonga and they're used to, the Smiths used to live on this road out here and they used to have a big barn. Well, the barn burned down. I'm two miles on the other side of that. Stuff like that. We have no idea what you're talking about. So be specific and give us something we can find on a map. Also, give us the location of the weather in addition to your location. So if you're reporting a tornado or a wall cloud or a funnel cloud, your location and the location of the weather should never be the same. So your, your reports of those kinds of things are always going to be something like, I am five miles northeast of Watonga. I'm looking about 10 miles to my north, and I think I see a tornado. That's what we're talking about. So you got to be very specific. Uh, be clear, calm, concise. Never assume that we already know what's going on. You may be the only person in the area that can see it or has experienced it. So never, ever assume we already know it because I guarantee we probably don't. Okay, what specifically to report? This is going to apply pretty much to any weather service office, but your local weather service office may have lower requirements. They may want to know about pea size hail, for example. But in our office, the, the baseline of what to report is what is the criteria for a severe thunderstorm. One inch hail, one inch in diameter, roughly the size of a quarter or bigger, winds of 58 miles an hour, either measured or estimated. And let us know whether you're measuring or estimating. With hail reports, you can estimate the hail size, you can compare it to a common object, you can say it's about the size of a golf ball or a little bit bigger than a lime or, you know, baseball size or tennis ball size, that's an estimate. Your estimate is fine, you don't have to be precise. If it's a little bit bigger or smaller than a golf ball, we don't care, just tell us about how big it is. If you want to be fancy and measure it, you can get a ruler and measure the largest or the biggest width of the hailstone. Well, hailstones are very rarely round or, or spherical. They're going to be spiky. So we need to know the longest uh, measurement of that. So if it's if it's longer on one side because of spikes, we need to know the whole long measurement of it. The very industrious chasers and observers will actually have electronic calipers that they use to give us very precise measurements. That's fine too, but you don't have to you don't have to do that. This is a chart of the the so-called common objects that you can use to report hail sizes. Some of these are common, dimes, pennies, nickels, quarters. We all pretty much know what those look like. Half dollar is kind of an antiquated size. Most people have never seen a half dollar. Ping pong balls, golf balls are fairly common. Limes are all different sizes, tennis balls, baseballs. Teacups is one that we need to get rid of and replace it with something else. The bottom line is give us your best estimate. A perfectly good report is for you to look outside and say, well, we got some hail on the ground. It's not quite tennis ball size, but it's 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 bigger than a golf ball, but it's smaller than a tennis ball. That's a great report. We'll, we will make up, we will fill in the blanks as far as the number goes, but you, that's all we need. Hail reports are the easiest to give and the most common things that you're going to be reporting in our area. Wind speeds are more complicated and reporting wind speeds can be very, very tricky. Even for meteorologists, it's very hard to look at something outside and estimate how hard the wind is blowing. Uh, this is a rough guideline. And again, this is available online in the spotter's guide and everywhere else. But most of us are going to overestimate the winds, especially in a stressful situation like a severe thunderstorm event. Uh, you're going to look at the sky, you're going to look outside, and if there's a warning in effect, all of a sudden, a 25 mile an hour wind is going to look like a 45 mile an hour wind just because of adrenaline and things like that. Just know that in our area, it takes about 55 to 60 mile an hour winds to start causing damage, to have large branches breaking off of trees and, and things like that, unless they're coated with ice, of course, but uh, that's a different story. Um, what's easier to report to us is wind damage. So even if you didn't see the wind blow, Blowing. Even if you weren't there, if you go to your farm over the weekend or you go to your grandma's house over the weekend and you see that there's damage there, you can report that to us then and you can tell us um, what it is and be, be descriptive of what happened. Let us know where the damage was. If you have any clue what time it happened, that would be good to know. Well, we think it happened sometime late Saturday night. 
we can zoom in or, or kind of hone in on that using radar data a lot of times. Give us a description or send us pictures, send us video of it. And if there's a trail of damage or if there's multiple points of damage, let us know that. Don't assume it was a tornado. Just because you come across a picture like that where it's like, oh my gosh, this barn was completely demolished. Well, it may have taken 60 mile an hour winds, straight line winds to completely demolish that barn depending on how it was built and if the doors were open or closed and there's all kinds of factors that go into that. So never assume it was a tornado that did the damage. Just give us the damage information reports. We may not always be able to go out and do a damage survey, so this can be very helpful for us. One of the, one of the most common things to report, but one of the most difficult to quantify really is flooding. Flooding has so many different meanings and definitions to different people. Now, if I showed you this picture, if you looked out your front window and saw this in your front yard, would you call this flooding? Is this flooding? Well, to you, I would call that, I would say my yard is flooded. I mean, it's flooded. I mean, there's water standing and it's there's water where there's not supposed to be water, but this is not flash flooding. I would not call this into the weather service and say, I have flash flooding in my yard. This is a localized, little high water spot here. The, the street isn't flooded. There's not widespread impacts. This yard is flooded. So that's not something you would report as flooding. What about this? Well, we're starting to now get into things that are um, impacting people, impacting vehicles. This is definitely flooding. I would report this as water covering the road. That vehicle shouldn't probably be driving out in that. It's, 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 it's you know, very, very difficult to tell how deep that water is. This is flooding. I would report this as flooding. I would definitely report this is flooding. This is water completely covering the road and you have absolutely no clue what's going on underneath that water. There, there's a little low spot there. There could be a culvert or a little uh, a ditch there or something going under the road that's been completely eroded and washed out. And you may drive across that thinking it's a foot of water and there's a four foot drop off there. So, um, you know, we all have different definitions of it. Somebody mentioned in the chat about an insurance definition of flooding. Well, that that's that may be, but when we're talking about what we need to know about flooding for is if we need to issue a flash flood warning, for example, or if we've already issued a flash flood warning. If it's flooding that poses an immediate threat to life and property, water getting into houses, getting into buildings, posing uh, risk to motorists, uh, stranding vehicles, closing roads, things like that. That's what we're talking about with flooding. These these two examples are very dramatic examples of flash flooding and something we would definitely need to know about. The water standing in the yard may be a problem. I've got a low spot in my yard right now where water's standing worse than that first picture we saw right now, uh, but I don't call it flooding. So it, 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 I know that there's different definitions according to which your perspective, but from a meteorological perspective and a storm spotter perspective, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so just to review, a good storm spotter observes what's going on in your local area, sends in reports of what you see, and above all else is safe. Remember that nothing you can provide to us. There is no report, no data, no video, no image, nothing that you can give us as a storm spotter that's worth your life, that's worth your uh, property being damaged, that's worth your auto insurance premiums going up because you drove into a hailstorm. None of that's worth it. We'd rather not have any information if it means you're gonna put yourself at risk. Don't do it. We don't want you to do it and we're not asking you to do it. Okay, that's the core of the storm spotting. Now I told you this is an overview. It's This is hard, this is very complicated. And if you sit in the advanced spotter training class tomorrow night, you'll hear it even being more complicated. And that's not even enough really to make you an experienced spotter. So just know that there's a lot to this. To learn more, you can go to our website, weather.gov slash O-U-N or slash Norman slash Skywarn. Skywarn is the storm spotter program of the National Weather Service. And on that page is a storm spotter guide. If we were doing in-person classes back in the day, there was no pandemic and we had unlimited budget to print these things. When you came to a storm spotter class, everybody that came would get a color brochure like this. And it has nice little diagrams and pictures and explanations of some of the stuff that we talked about. I can't give you a printed version, but you can go online and get the actual storm spotter guide that has printed diagrams. And it will help you go back and review some of the things we talked about here tonight. So go find that on our website. 
We also have a YouTube channel where we have a recorded version of, of an older recorded version of this training. We need to update it, but you can go back and review things. So if you want to, if I went too fast over rotating wall clouds or night spotting, you can go and actually review some of those in more detail uh, on our YouTube page where the action area is. And they're in bite-sized chunks. So they're in like five or 10 minute segments. Some of them are as short as a minute or two where you can go and review those at, at, your, at your own pace. Um, and some of that, and there's all kinds of stuff on there too. There's some of the advanced training material uh, is on there as well. There are modules available, um, and some of you may have, have already taken some of these, but there's two modules out there that you register for and take a quiz at the end and you get a certificate for passing, but these are the role of the Skywarn Spotter and Skywarn Spotter Convective Basics. This is National Weather Service training that's it's done at the national level, and um, we get notified when you complete this training uh, as well. So that's a really good site uh, to get some training. Now, we've gotten some questions from some of you that indicate that some of you really want a, a lot more. You want to get deep, deep, deep into the, the meteorology and the details. Well, there's a way to do that too. Um, a couple of years ago, the OU School of Meteorology here in the building teamed up with the Storm Prediction Center to conduct a severe thunderstorm forecasting lecture series, and it's all recorded. So this is online and there's the URL and I'll, I'll send you the, when I send the email with the certificate, I'll, you'll get all these links. I'll include all these. So don't worry about furiously copying them down or anything. But if you want to get into the, de the, the, the ugly math calculus and differential equations and physics of some of this stuff, this is where you do that. So this is where you'll see uh, why meteorology is so complicated with the quasi-geostrophic theory and the perturbation pressure and all these equations and things like that. But this is very good and we're very fortunate that they recorded this because this does give the people that really want to get in more detail about supercells and tornadoes, for example. There's a great, probably a 45 minute lecture on that that you can really dig into. So um, I hope hope you're able to, to participate in that if you'd like to. Okay, we kind of reached the end of the, um, the presentation here. There's some more mo modest clouds outside the building here from last spring. Um, so I appreciate you attending. I'm gonna pause here and just look and see if there's any more questions. I know I missed a bunch of questions, but I knew I wouldn't be able to cover them all, but thank you all for bearing with me. This went a little bit longer than I intended. Um, uh, somebody asked about, could this be done in other parts of the country, in Montana, for example? Every single weather service office in the country does storm spotter training classes. They may not be exactly like this, but contact your local National Weather Service office. Go find them on the web, send them an email, call them on the phone, uh, get on their social media and ask them about their storm spotter training. Everybody uh, does this. Um, and so, yeah, that's you should definitely participate in one of those in your local area. Uh, where do watches warnings advisories come from? Uh, watches warnings advisories are issued by the National Weather Service. Uh, our local office here and each of the 122 local offices around the country issue those warnings and advisories. A lot of watches are issued by the local offices. Things like tornado and severe thunderstorm watches come from the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center. Hurricane watches, tropical storm watches come from the National Weather Service Hurricane Center. Um, so, Anyway, that, that's where those come from. Again, I will email you a blank certificate. So if five people attended this class with you, you're gonna get one PDF of a blank certificate. You can print that out five times and have people fill in their name. That's how we do that. I will send it to the email address that you use to register. Finally, if you haven't told me how many people attended the training with you, how many people are watching it, put that number in there now if you haven't already done it. If you did it earlier, you don't need to do it again, but if you haven't done it, go ahead and stick that in there so I'll know how many people were there. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, things to make the training better, let me know. And please remember that advanced training is tomorrow night at 6.30 to 8.30. Two of our best meteorologists, our forecasters that actually do the forecast day to day are going to be presenting that. And it's very good, very good training. So if you're interested in this tonight, you'll love tomorrow night. So again, go and find the URL on our website, on our Twitter feed, on the National Weather Festival a social media, they had the link for registering for the advanced class. We have over 500 people signed up for it already. So it's very, very popular. Thank you so much for attending. We have people from all over the world here tonight from the UK and um, 
the Virgin Islands and all over the place. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to go hope that the power is back on at my house when I get home. And uh, we, we appreciate everybody joining us. Thank you so much.